All right, let's do the gallbladder. Keep in mind, the gallbladder is extremely complicated. This is a year one, first pass conversation about it. There's a lot more I'd like to say, but this is what you need to know in year one. Let's start off with the statements of fact. The gallbladder stores and excretes bile. There's some discussion of bile as a pure substance. There's just some discussion of this being one of the reasons why the gallbladder is both a normal foo and an extraordinary, a qihong foo. And this is due to the fact that foo organs are supposed to transmit but not store, they're supposed to be empty. And the gallbladder actually has a function of storing. This makes it something different. Still a foo, also not. The second statement of fact is that the gallbladder controls decisiveness. Anytime you have a patient or a person that you're working with who just can't make up their mind about things, the gallbladder will be involved. We talked about the Sanjiao being unable to separate the clear from the turbid. That's someone who looks at a situation and can't tell what the right decision is. This is more for people who say things like, I know I should break up with my partner, I just can't. Or, I know I should go back to school. I know I should quit my job. There's a certain amount of having the gall to do something that is gallbladder related. A lot of the statements we have within Western culture about what organs do, like having the gall to do something, are surprisingly connected to the Chinese understanding of those organs. The gallbladder controls the sinews. This is mostly just the wood function. Anything related to the contractile force of the muscles is going to be related to the wood phase, gallbladder is the yang aspect of that, therefore the more that we're talking about the physical motion, the more we're talking about the gallbladder. The more we're talking about the mental, emotional, spiritual side of contraction and release, the more we're talking about the liver. The gallbladder has within it and commands ministerial fire. We're going to do a thing on ministerial fire later. The rest of the statements of fact about the gallbladder are ones that we're not going to be going into much detail about here, but I want you to know that the gallbladder is the mansion of the central essence. This is often referred to as just talking about bile, that essence means a pure substance, and that the excess of the liver overflows into the gallbladder and creates this pure substance called bile. I have a strong intuition that there's more than this, but for now, the gallbladder is the mansion of the central essence, and the central essence is bile. The last of the statements of fact is that the 11 zong depend on the gallbladder. My assumption here is that 11 zong means the 11 zong and fu within the original classical interpretation of five yin and six zong organs. The yang wood is something upon which all other organs depend. This could be referring to the decisiveness as well. People with really extreme gallbladder deficiency tend to basically not do anything. And the 11 zong certainly rely on action occurring, but I'm not quite positive what's intended here. The gallbladder does also have a lot of connections to other organs. We're only gonna talk about a little of that right now, but being young wood and being in control of decisiveness, that ability kind of slides around and influences everything. The first thing we're gonna talk about is the connection between the gallbladder and the heart. I've heard it referred to as the secret spy of the heart. And I think this is a good way to begin thinking about what we mean by decisiveness. The gallbladder provides courage and decisiveness to the mind, and through that, the emperor is able to make correct decisions. When you have someone whose life is extremely disordered, who's lost most of their shen, their spirits are missing, this may be someone with a history of addiction, this may be someone who's been through abuse, there are many ways this can happen, but someone who's truly disordered, the gallbladder is one of the ways that we can influence their deepest level that we can communicate to them how to move forward. Or perhaps more accurately, how we can aid them in communicating to themselves again. This is sometimes referred to as a person's conscience, as the voice in their head telling them what they should or shouldn't do. All of that's gallbladder related. People who doubt themselves pathologically often have a gallbladder pathology. When we look at general gallbladder pathology, it looks a lot like the liver. This is due in large part to it being a very influential and powerful foo organ. Most of our foo organs are largely involved with the digestive system, with the processing and the distribution of resources. The gallbladder is less involved with that. Its issues manifest in the digestive system, just like the livers do. And so you can see hypochondriacal pain, you can see burping, and gas, but the addition here is that it has a very strong effect on the mental emotional state. It also has a strong tendency to overlap with the liver in terms of the sorts of problems that you're dealing with. When we talked about the lung and the heart, 
not paired organs, but physically paired in their location. We mentioned that lung heat can cause heart heat over time simply due to their proximity. With liver and gallbladder, we often see liver or gallbladder conditions transmitting to the other to the degree that we end up with diagnoses like liver gallbladder damp heat, where the differentiation of which organ is being more affected doesn't really matter. And being a foo organ, as with all the foo organs, it tends more towards excess and stagnation than to deficiency. In its tendency towards excess, we mostly see an accumulation of dampness, and then either hot or cold. And this is usually due to diet, especially greasy and fatty foods. You'll often hear recommendations from acupuncturists to avoid too many greasy or fatty foods. That's often gallbladder and liver related. When I was a student, I would hear phrases like, don't eat food that is too greasy or fatty. And I often wondered, what do we mean by too in this statement? How do we know whether something is greasier or fattier than it should be, especially given that different people seem to have different tolerances for these things. I define too greasy or fatty as greasy or fatty enough that we begin seeing influences on the digestive system, such as a breakdown of the ability to rot and ripen, or transform and transport, or an accumulation of dampness that begins to arise on the tongue, or signs of liver and gallbladder stagnation. If the spleen and stomach don't do their jobs, and there's too much heavy, greasy food, then we will begin to see that accumulate in the gallbladder and or liver and or rest of the digestive system. In terms of emotions, the gallbladder is affected in basically the same way that the liver is. Anger, frustration, bottled up resentment, all of these affect the gallbladder. But we have an additional thing. There's a phrase in Mandarin, tatan, which means big gallbladder, and more or less translates to having a lot of guts or being courageous. A weak gallbladder, gallbladder chi deficiency, will cause timidity. We see this quite a bit in young children who are timid. Sometimes building up the gallbladder can help them to regain a little bit of force. In terms of external pathogenic factors, the gallbladder is going to be pretty much the same as the liver. Excessively hot and damp climates are going to add a burden onto it, which will then make it more sensitive to hot, greasy, or cold, greasy foods coming into their system. Getting into gallbladder pathology, we don't have too much to talk about here at this level. A lot of what I see happening with gallbladder tends to be channel related and mental emotional, and we're just not quite there right now. So sticking with the actual organ pathology, the zong fu pathology, we've got three different things we're gonna talk about. Our first pattern is dampness in the gallbladder. We've got a number of symptoms of dampness within the middle jowl, like sticky taste, dull headache, feeling of heaviness, fullness and distension, hypochondriacal pain. Those don't tell us a whole lot about where the dampness is yet. It could be liver, could be gallbladder, could even just be middle jowl itself. But we have a number of unique symptoms that are more gallbladder related. The first one of those is jaundice. When you think of jaundice within a Western medical context, you tend to think of a really extreme yellowing, the sclera turning yellow, the skin turning, almost a green tea color. But within this context, what we mean is often a subclinical expression of that yellowness on the skin. Often the sclera is not affected at all, or there's minor lines of yellow on the sides of the eyes. That's enough for us to begin thinking that there might be some dampness involved in this situation affecting the gallbladder. The next is nausea and vomiting. This can also just be a dampness in the, in the stomach issue or liver overacting on stomach issue. But when we get the dampness is showing up in the gallbladder, we get a blockage at the bottom of the physical stomach organ, which causes counterflow to occur. We can be quite certain that we have a dampness in the gallbladder situation, perhaps with other things as well, if our patient has their condition exacerbated by fatty or greasy food. If upon eating french fries, our patient becomes nauseated, loses their thirst, gets hypochondriacal pain, gets a headache, we begin thinking this is probably a dampness in the gallbladder related condition. Cloudy urine is a common symptom of dampness within the gallbladder. I think of this almost exclusively as turbidity attempting to be removed through the urine. There are other conditions in which we can be losing substances we want to keep resulting in cloudy urine, but in this case this is mostly just dampness being drained somewhat ineffectively. We can treat this through continuing to drain while also holding back anything clear that we want to keep. And lastly, we've got a lack of thirst. Anytime you have this middle jowl accumulation, you can end up with not wanting to bring in more substances. Next, we've got damp heat in the gallbladder. Whole bunch of common symptoms here, hypochondriacal pain, fullness and distension, nausea, 
vomiting, worse with fat, bitter taste, irritability. This isn't really telling us much except that there's damp heat. We don't really know where yet. The patient also has scanty and dark urine due to some fluids being cooked off. Thirst without desire to drink. Numbness of the limbs. Problems with the sinews being affected. Fluid distribution being affected to the body. And alternating hot and cold sensations indicating some level of a Shaoyang imbalance. But then we're going to be thinking damp heat in the gallbladder. And the last symptom we're going to cover is gallbladder deficiency. Gallbladder deficiency is a very interesting condition, and if we can catch it, we can do amazing things to improve people's lives. This is just a beginning of an introduction to this concept, and you're not going to see it that often. First symptom is dizziness. This is due to a lack of that clarity coming to the heart, coming to the head and the gallbladder. It might be channel-related as well. Blurred vision and floaters. That's due to the wood connection to the eyes. We would see that with the liver as well. But from there, we start getting into the more psycho-emotional and fuzzy aspect of this, which is where this diagnosis and our ability to treat it really shines. Patients with gallbladder deficiency will tend to be nervous. They'll tend to startle easily. This is the patient where you knock on the door at the end of the session, open the door, and the patient's asleep. And as you step into the room, they jump with a start every single week. You should change what you're doing if that's happening. But every single week. These people tend to have a lack of courage and a lack of initiative. They tend to be timid. They tend to be indecisive. They tend to be frustrating to work with because of all of this. But understand, these are manifestations of a pathology which can be treated. One of the things that the gallbladder deficiency does is affects the hun. So we tend to see patients that wake up early in the morning, can't really sleep through a full night comfortably, and also have restless dreams. Restless dreams involving that timidity, that fear, that indecision, involving the symptoms of the state that they live in day to day. That's all we got for year one of the gallbladder. There's so much more here, and we'll come back to it in the future in other ways. If you have any questions, put them on the Slack, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.